Hello, welcome to a new Ring Bookcast with Artistically R. In this new series, I'll be interviewing more neurodivergent people about the neurodivergent stories. We'll be giving more in-depth interviews and discussions on what it means to be neurodivergencies. And we'll be a more personal one and hopefully I'll be giving you a bit more details about myself. This is the first one in a while. Since last year, previously brought you a new C podcast show called Pacifying with Artistically R, exploring the ultimate new divergent comfort blanket, self care, and what it means to look after your well being. And through the lens of in the first few episodes of being, I hope you can check that out. Just certain for pacifying with artistically or are on podcast platforms or on YouTube and on the new Rainbow Project Facebook page with Lavender Raina and Minimus. And hopefully, I'll get some more episodes up on that show as well. If you want to try out the pacifiers yourself, you can use the discount. A pacifying pod when you make your first order with pacifier addicts. If you follow them on social media, may I see a bit more about that podcast. So, and as I say, please check it out. And within Apple Podcasts, you can find it within the podcast channel, New Rainbow Project at. Reminder, if you want to get in touch with the podcast, it's at it's New Rainbow at New Rainbow Project dot com and on social media at New Rainbow Project on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Threads, and Blue Sky, and you'll be able to find on a New Rainbow Project dot com website how you can some of these podcast interviews and follow the social media get in touch with any ideas you'd like to see like any guests that you would want to come on podcasts to discuss any themes for the episodes and any I would like to launch a regular Ask Artistically R so let's get into this a deep dive into PDA My name's Christine Robinson, and I started nine months ago a account, Everyday PDA, where I talk about pathological demand avoidance or what is often preferred by those in the autism community as persistent or pervasive drive or desire for autonomy. My two children both are PDA, one of whom is diagnosed as autistic with a PDA profile. The other is undiagnosed, self-identified. My husband also self-identifies as a PDA or himself, and I also identify as neurodivergent. So excited to chat with you a little bit more about PDA. How would you define PDA? Is it something that you see as a separable condition to autism, or do you think it's linked to conditions like autism and ADHD? So PDA is widely considered at this stage to be a profile of autism and a nervous system disability, although we're still very early in our understanding and PDA research is on its infancy, having only been first proposed in the 1980s. There is some debate around that. My experience with it, I have limited exposure, but in our family, it definitely seems to be a profile of autism. So I do see those autistic traits in my children and in my husband, even though not all of them are currently diagnosed. There is some question around whether if it is highly associated with autism, whether it makes sense to have it be a separate diagnosis, given the presentation is pretty unique and the strategies that tend to be used to support individuals who are PDA are a little bit differentiated from some of the more traditional strategies that you might see in other presentations of autism. Uh, So as you said that, it can be a bit more unique to autism, even though it's connected to the attributes of being autistic. And it's, that's how it's been characterised with like the research and the understanding for it until this day. Do you want to tell me about how you think it can be seen as 
unique thought is that man how you may recognize it as something that might be not in itself just a part of being autistic. That demand avoidance, which is less neuroaffirming language used to talk about PDA, is a part of it, but it's definitely not all of it. Demand avoidance is something that I think all humans face, regardless of neurotype, and is also common in autistic and ADHD individuals. Sometimes that underlying root cause of the demand avoidance might be different. That's the key difference with PDA is the cause of that demand avoidance and being driven by that anxiety-driven need to control given their survival drive for autonomy and equality. I think that survival drive piece is key. With PDA individuals, you often see that need for autonomy and equality will override other survival needs. Oftentimes we'll see eating, sleeping, hygiene, habits impacted, safety. I think of a story with my son where we were at the park and he was running away from us. You say stop and you're telling them what to do, which is perceived by their brains as that loss of autonomy. Instead of stopping, he accelerates and not just like running away, some kids may do anyways, but actually running into and towards a busy street with no intent of stopping. That strong survival drive for autonomy that can differentiate it from other demand avoidance types of behaviors that can be more common across neurotypes. As you described, yourself would recognize that as an anxiety response and a survival response. But in like the world of being judgmental or hyper-focused on more how to perceive it through a lens of not what that person is born for in their own mind in that situation, but how we sometimes people negatively reflect on that and might see that as not as an anxiety thing, but as being disruptive or defiant yeah. and just yes. acting up. So how do you find that stigma around it? Did you always feel that it's just a survival response? Oppositional defiance disorder is another common misdiagnosis for PDA individuals. The can present similarly. Another difference that sets PDA apart. Also, my husband frequently talks to me about how one of the hardest parts for him is how it also act interferes with his ability to access things that he really wants to do. That is unique to PDA versus that ODD presentation. To answer your question, no, I didn't always see it in that lens. Going way back, there were things that were unusual or unexpected to me about my daughter when she was younger. She was really jumpy get very easily startled or sensitive to changes in my facial expression or tone or movement and that translated to things like being unable to watch typical kids movies because i think a lot of those movies take on more of a theatrical presentation where expressions and movements are exaggerated not what a, a person would typically think is a scary part of the movie so there were things like that that were a bit raised questions for me certainly drove me to research and autism came up a few times, but she just didn't seem to me to fit at the time stereotypical view of what autism was. I had a lot of educating to do with myself to arrive at where I am today. But the other piece of a lot of people's journeys in this process is that when we started seeing more behavioral challenges and when that started to happen more significantly for us was when my daughter started school. She entered a structured environment where she had less autonomy. We started seeing those more challenging behaviors at home. We tried everything. We tried doing different parenting approaches, more authoritarian, more gentle parenting approaches, timeouts. That didn't work. Talking about our emotions. That worked for a week or two, and then it stopped being effective. Reward charts and sticker charts. We took her to therapy, to our pediatrician and other professionals about the meltdown she was experiencing. And everything that was recommended just didn't seem to work and escalated the situation and made it worse. That's one of the hard things as you shift into a parenting approach that is more low demand and supportive of the PDA neurotype, you do face a lot of judgment from others. That's one of the hardest things. And one of the things I try to focus on with everyday PDA is 
helping the parents with their transformation, because I think a huge part of it is learning to unlearn social norms, to let go of the judgment of others, to learn about setting boundaries with others. And that's what I try to focus on and support families, because there is a lot of stigma around these types of behaviors. Parents who are raising PDAers face a lot of criticism. And a lot of people don't understand that most of us in this journey before we were aware of how to best support our children's neurotype had tried everything that most people <laughs> will recommend when they see the struggles that we're having. As you were saying early on, that is new in terms of language, being new in terms of PDA being diagnosed and read. And for any doctors being able to tell you that your child has PDA, some people may lack that awareness and education. As I said, you can have to be generations of parental behaviors on how to perceive children as like normally doing it through like a neurotypical parent's lens and is ten challenging for a parent when you tried so many different things to work out what the behaviors of your daughter and understand more firstly I want to ask you what does opposite demand of disorder is and secondly what those early things like you notice from your daughter that when she started school that portrayed as challenging behaviors and how like people could see that maybe as being disruptive or your child lasting out like in just being a bit naughty when they start in school when they struggle or like it's been like a condition like PDA or a never lingual division condition like autism or ADHD. You asked about oppositional defiance disorder. Yeah. I'm not an expert. It is essentially a diagnosis of behavioral defiant, where there's strong defiance of compliance with requests and demands, et cetera, which does present similarly to PDA at times. I think that's why there is some common experience where that has been diagnosed but just hasn't sat right with the parents or the strategies recommended that are more behavioral modification types of strategies haven't been effective. With PDA, some of the behaviors and things that I saw in some of the key traits was really resisting that and avoiding ordinary demands of life. And so it's not just around things that people don't want to do or that are big, hard to break down tasks or kind of where there's some logical or even conscious aversion to them. It can be things like getting dressed, making and attending appointments, brushing teeth, getting out of bed in the morning, often for the simple reason that they are demands or expectations and therefore represent that loss of autonomy. There's no other reason why they're avoiding it. Those demands can be internal as I'm hungry, I have to eat. If a PDA individual waits too long and feels that sensation of hunger, sometimes they will struggle to even access food because their brain is interpreting that sensation of hunger as a demand. They can also be external. This is a lot of the ones that parents will notice more and is more apparent at times, especially in PDAers who externalize their threat response. That's where, for my daughter, I noticed this a lot, where we really started to struggle with the getting ready for school process and getting on her shoes. And it wasn't just one thing. It was everything was so hard and required constant creativity and what what worked one day wouldn't work the next. It was just a fight to get through every single little step of the day. Demands can also be more implied or societal. So like, this is the way you wear your shirt. This is how you write your letters. Everyone pays taxes that aren't even actually explicitly said, but are implied or known. I've seen this come through with my daughter and it was on social media video I saw where someone talked about this and then I kept watching their videos and saw so much of my daughter that really turned me on. My daughter, when she's dysregulated especially, will often, all of a sudden, she doesn't do this often, but will like write her entire words backwards or she'll write her letters backwards um, where she ordinarily does not. And so sometimes even just things like kids who insist on wearing their shirts backwards or inside out. <laughs> um, it can be even just things that are expected of them as sort of societal norms, that this is how you do it, that you can see some of that resistance. And then it can also be, and again, it, this resistance is usually irrespective of whether the demand is something the PDA or wants to do. The other day, my daughter was hungry. She hadn't eaten much at school and she got home and she was so hungry. I was asked, I wondered what I can get for you. She said, I really want mac and cheese, but I also don't. 
she was struggling with, like, she was very hungry and knew what she wanted, but was, I don't think I can do it. Even though she was obviously very hungry and knew what she wanted, but just really couldn't access it. That's another kind of aspect of it where people don't know enough about, or that's one of the really tough things for the individual in it. The other thing I've mentioned too, that is go through a few of these things. There's usually see a variety of strategies to protect autonomy and avoid demands. Oftentimes they're kind of social in nature. So it could include like just ignoring a lot of parents of PDAers have noted questioning if their child had hearing challenges because they would just ignore them so much. They may try to distract, delay, or procrastinate. Say, I'll do that after I finish this video, or I'll do that after I do this. Giving excuses. My son will oftentimes just, when he doesn't want to leave a place, he'll just stop walking and say, my legs aren't working. They're not working. I can't do it. Up to sort of outright of refusal or even threats. Like, if you don't do this, I'll do this. Negotiating. I'll do X if you do Y. And some will enter into role play and say things like, I'm a dog and dogs can't do that. There's a lot of different strategies that you'll see used by PDAers when they are trying to protect their autonomy um, and equality. As with PDA and the definition of what it can present as, it can be complex to recognize it. And it's kind of in different neurodivergencies and different disabilities because similar traits like everything to be like almost unable to, like, want to get up a bed in the morning or do certain stuff like hygiene tasks, like brushing their teeth, or well, well, that can be seen as something like linked to experiencing depression and mental health issues, to, as I said, when you were taught it was right to act front, and that, like, somebody could easily think that. Be concerned whether that appears as dyslexia and as into that, then you know, feel like you mm-hmm. don't work in any more than unable to have the energy to make like certain things like mac and cheese. Maybe there's like chronic fatigue to that type of stuff as well. So for a PTA, you met with like a myriad of different issues where you're going to have to look at like finding them for all the kind of puzzling different like, like ways of what's what and with it, because when you were saying that, when you were looking into things for your daughter, tried all different therapies and different methods of parenting, like you kind of go like tick, you know, like go through a list of different boxes of what things can be, and as you into this, can be quite co diagnosed condition. Absolutely. I think some of these things are things I still don't have the answers to with my kiddos. I don't have any formal diagnoses myself, but dyslexia is something I have commonly questioned about whether it might be something that I have in my daughter. I identify as ADHD and I can see some of those traits in my children. It is super complex because I think so many of these conditions are co-occurring. I think that we'll continue (laughs) to sort through some of that and separate some of that out. For us, at least with my daughter in particular, The dominant thing that presents challenges for her right now is the PDA and that autonomy and equality. That is where we have been focusing. And I think in supporting her needs as an autistic individual as well. As she got more and more burned out, her autistic traits became more and more apparent to me as a parent. Looking back again, I see some of them from when she was young, when she was, you know, even an infant. And same with PDA too, and I think that's important, is that PDA is also considered to be a neurotype and something that's present from birth. And even just things with like feeding and sleeping challenges we saw. Certainly there could be other explanations for some of these things, but the autonomy lens also does make sense when I think back to some of those early experiences. And one video that I remember kind of going back and looking at when I was preparing for her assessment that was just like struck me was she was about maybe not even maybe just over one years old. And she was collecting these little plastic balls that had been strewn across the room and placing them in a basket. And she was going one by one and picking the balls up and putting them in the basket one by one. And she picked up one ball and went to carry it over the basket. And just as she was about to put it in the basket, I said, put it in the basket. She just stopped dead in her tracks 
and like walked away from the basket and went and got another ball and put it and got it before she put it in the basket. And knowing my daughter, like I do now, I look back at that and I'm like, she was, I gave her a command. I told her what to do. And I could see in that moment and watching the video that avoidance that like, now I can't do it. And I think that's one of the things I hear adult PDAers. And I spend a lot of time listening to and talking with and following and reading content from adult autistic PDAers because they are the experts. And I learned a lot from my husband and my kids, but I'm not PDA myself. And so I spend a lot of time learning from those with the lived experience. And I often hear them say things like, I'll be in the middle of doing a task or about to do a task and someone will tell me to do it. And then I can't do it. And it's so frustrating. And I and I see that with my daughter. As you're like talking about autonomy and as say that almost like for a disabled person, and, you know, at least when you like acknowledging or acknowledging and recognizing your disability for the first time and to you notice know, how it means you're disabled, but then and, and when you start to compare yourself to other people and get and notice how you like you can't do everything like other people at first. You got you overcoming that internal battle of all internalized people is some of like feeling you lack a certain autonomy and things not as equal with you for ever with any with typical non disabled people. And that is something that people will look at, yeah, as like an autonomy and also mm. noticing societally things are unequal. So what is it that you mean by your leg? What is an AD, a PDA person's view of equality and autonomy? I think that people talk a lot about the demand avoidance part and and even autonomy, but I think the equality piece is really equally important. I think that what you said was really interesting because I think there is this aspect of internalized ableism that comes through with, right, this, and oftentimes I think, you know, I might see this in my husband and how he's sort of viewed himself until just, you know, recently as we made this discovery about our kids and he sort of saw this in himself, but he's definitely had that struggle with internalized ableism and, you know, his challenges with his career and his struggles with relationships. And he's always felt sort of those things and sort of viewed it, right? Like many, I think individuals in these circumstances do is sort of a moral failing. It was something that was wrong with him (laughs) or he was just not good at these things or whatever it might be. Figuring out that he was PDA, it was like a huge answer for him in terms of his experiences as he reflected back on so many things. But I think even still, right, I think he struggles with this idea of disability and how that's viewed in the world and being PDA. I think that can be even hard to sort of accept some of these things because you have those that internalized ableism and the social conditioning around um, that. And I think he struggles with it from that perspective. And it can also sort of be this thing of, well, that's going to other people are going to perceive me based on this diagnosis and if I'm perceived as less than, right, that might be triggering to my PDA. And so it's it's complex. And I think there's also the aspect of equality that plays into that because he feels, this again is a little internalized ableism too, but he feels, he's often talked about how he feels like, well, there are so many people who are, have so much more struggle than I do in terms of their disability. And so he sort of can discredit his own struggles because he doesn't want to take away from the struggle of others. And I think that's a lot of internalized ableism at play for sure. But I think that also is that like that balance thing. He doesn't want to, and that goes both ways. He doesn't want to take or put others in a position of feeling less than, but also doesn't want to feel that himself. To guess with the word autonomy when you're playing that internalized ableism and that ableism from society, like sometimes for like a pe- some do as the traits of PDA, sometimes you deal with the idea of feeling that the demand for you dance is autonomous if like sus- if like sometimes you feel that societal views and like just the way the society is kind of 
fighting against that idea that you have that sense of autonomy over over yourself. Even though I've said that, like being able to like demand being involved in self demands can actually be mixed with that. You only do one of the things that you went to do a like uh, looks of any comfort zone. And like you looked on the posts and of you made on that you made on social media and one thing yeah, you said with like the term PDA, the way they sense for pathological demands avoidance, there's some who would think that it could be called persistent uh, to demand and autonomy. What, like, do you think that is a better definition of the term uh, PDA? I do feel like the persistent or pervasive drive, desire for autonomy is a more accurate depiction of the experience from listening to other PDAers. But there's even amongst adult PDAers, them, there's some debate around naming convention, this or that. And I think it's semantics. What I think really wish happened was that at the onset, people with the lived experience were involved in sort of that. Because I think there's something about right all of the research and kind of naming and de development of this being done outside of the community of those with a lived experience. It doesn't fully depict, um, as many of these sort of things don't, the experience of those who live with PDA. Even just persistent or pervasive drive for autonomy, that is a more preferred more neuroaffirming language to describe PDA. From my experience, that also doesn't really fully re reflect the experience. It misses out on that desire for equality. To me, those things are, and that's the area where my husband related a lot more and more of his sort of triggers and things that were really activating to his PDA brain are more in that realm of losses of equality, others not being considerate of others, things like someone stopping at the top of the escalator and not like moving out of the way or people who refuse to move to the side on the footpath to make room for people who are walking on the same space as them. Those types of things, while annoying to many, and I think that's what's interesting about this and hard to help people understand is these are all human experiences and my kids' annoyance or frustration or reaction to these things aren't necessarily invalid. Like oftentimes they're things that many kids, adults, people would struggle with. It's that intensity and the inability to control sort of that reaction at times, given it's tied to the threat response that really differentiates these experiences. Sound when you were saying about it being someone sometimes semantics or over the prep, you know, over what language is used. But as we're saying then, when you got that sense of injustice and the element of with disabilities and newer divergencies, yes, there are like some challenging disabling aspects of it, but there are some positive, you know, things within it. It's yes. that like that people need to recognise the complex and they want to use of it that the original labeling and definition doesn't always recognized. And as you say that for as you said, if your husband who be having a condition just like PDA couldn't be seen as by that. It's been behaviors been negatively interpreted by other yeah. people. But it's sometimes it's a more of a reactionary to other people wrongly be evolved as in just like injustice or inequality. And I guess sometimes that could be questioned with like the definition of ADHD as the damage of deficit. So the, the, within the new divergent community, there is definitely, even though you want to be a, it a awareness of such conditions, but and all the information that comes with it. But there's like an eagerness about getting the language right around it. And I even of that, that, I assume that the awareness of what it is is more of your own priority. I've shifted my language on my page to always try to include sort of the more neuroaffirming, but I think it is a hard sort of battle of like pathological demand avoidance is sort of the most widely 
known terms. And there is that battle I've faced in trying to balance the community gets sort of split apart in terms of like what we call something. It can slow sort of the progress of building that awareness. But language does matter. And I acknowledge that. I know that it is really important to many people. And so I always want to try to respect people's individual preferences. Um, I always try to sort of put both languages forward and acknowledging the fact that, you know, many in the autistic community prefer the more neuroaffirming, persistent, you know, drive for autonomy. But it is for me, a big priority for me is awareness. And also, I think a big goal for me is really trying to help parents who are struggling as I was not to feel so alone. It can be very isolating. And I think a lot of people might think that some of the hardest parts is dealing with the challenging behaviors, but in reality, I think the hardest part is, is the feeling alone and the feeling judged or even worse blamed that you somehow caused these challenges with your child. And so I think that my goal is really to really sort of help provide a different lens that people might look at their children through and see whether it fits and help them feel less alone in the challenges that come along with parenting differently. Yeah, you want to be able to provide information, reliable information that people might not be able to get through wherever the local support services or diagnose neurodivergent conditions or wherever that's like anybody who works like to diagnose young children and works with young children and wherever that's in the educational or any health systems that way you don't have the that has much information out on PDA as it is in the early stages of understanding so what was it like then when your children were getting diagnosed with the neurodivergent conditions, the information out there? And it was hard. Is Again, as my daughter started kind of more approaching burnout, I definitely started to see the autistic traits more apparently. And that was sort of encouragement for me that, okay, maybe pursuing a formal diagnosis makes sense. But I think that self-diagnosis, I firmly believe, is valid. And I think there are so many reasons why the diagnosis process can be difficult. I mean, it can be inaccessible for because of wait lists. It can be inaccessible because of costs. And the assessments themselves can be biased and be more challenging to discern some of these more complex cases, whether it be presentation in girls or people of color or people who have significant co-occurring conditions that cause the presentation to perhaps be a bit different than what is expected. And so there's a lot of reasons why I think self-diagnosis is 100% valid. In our case, I think, and in many people's cases, we decided we wanted to pursue a formal diagnosis in order to access and have more, I guess, ammunition to get her, my daughter some of the supports that I felt she needed to be able to hopefully continue within the formal school environment, as that was her desire, our desire. And we went through the process once. I think I was really knowing kind of a lot of what I just described. I sought out PDA aware practitioners, but I quickly learned that even, you know, being aware of it doesn't necessarily mean that someone is an expert in it or is skilled or experienced in identifying it and seeing those nuances as they evaluate the individual for autism. And that was our sort of first experience. We went through the whole diagnostic process once with my daughter and did not receive a diagnosis. Um, and we continued managing and supporting her in the way that we knew was best. And we then sought a, I sought counsel from other families who've been through this process and was recommended perhaps different assessments that could be more neuroaffirming and particularly for a female presentation. 
and also was recommended some specific clinics. And so I think that in this diagnosis process for people who are wanting to pursue a formal diagnosis of autism for a child or individual they suspect may be PDA or have a PDA profile, doing the research to find the right professionals to work with, I think is really important and doing some vetting to really ensure that they are skilled and knowledgeable of the current understanding of autism and how it can present differently. And also that they are knowledgeable of PDA and how it presents differently and what some of those more PDA types of presentations across the various criteria can look like. And so we went through the process again just recently and were able to get that formal diagnosis for my daughter and so that we could start to pursue more formal supports for her as well. Uh, so it seems after the process for getting her officially medically recognized as autistic, it's something that you're still ongoing with. And so I guess you've been for like seen like PDA uh, practitioners and PDA services in your country. Uh, and so what has it been like for, you know, you to go to PDA, PDA practitioners, what are like the services out there and what are uh, your experiences of practitioners? Is it something that you think that people in many like countries would be able to reach out and find within the community yeah. and it's uh, not yeah it's it's not easy by any means i think that there are lists that are kind of compiled and you know i know i've seen one for the us i've seen one for australia new zealand there are oftentimes you can find lists that individuals in the community have compiled of pda where professionals whether it's occupational therapists, speech therapists, pediatricians, psychologists. And so there are those resources. But again, I had one experience with someone I found on one of those lists who was aware, but definitely was not as experienced and knowledgeable in sort of the assessment process of assessing individuals who have PDA. And so I think that it's still very necessary to do due diligence. And I think that, you know, in our case, we ended up actually, after getting more like hands-on recommendations from individuals who've been through processes with clinics. And so I think if you can, talking to community is a really helpful aspect to do that um, and to get recommendations from people who've had kind of successful experiences or positive experiences. Um, but in our case, we ended up flying <laughs> across the country to access a clinic that we felt like had that expertise and experience in order to accurately assess our daughter for autism, considering her PDA profile. Um, and so I think that there is growing awareness and there are professionals out there, but it isn't always accessible for a variety of reasons. And in our case, we had the privilege to be able to to fly across country to access that not everyone does and again a huge reason why i think self-diagnosis is valid although yeah. it's unfortunate right that so often diagnosis is necessary to get the supports and services that one needs yeah as you said then like self-diagnosis of course is valid but then it is not easy if you can't at least get the support within your local vicinity and like living in where country has lads so Australia it's never ideal if you have to travel right across the country by uh, aeroplane and going on a was long yeah. journey and I guess that uh, says the issue about the lack of services for like the wider neurodivergent community because as I said they may have like sparse and limited service or a service on autism in your community, but they might not be as aware and as inclusive to people, or girls, or people who are identified as girls and women, and like minority genders, to you know people of color. There's 
some there's the last right male prevalence and been like diagnosed, but there's lots of black women and women, the girls and minority genders, people that's where late diagnosis is happening and going. And but as I said, from that, it's something that I guess where the importance of finding a community and network. So how was it finding that community? You know, what were the, like, the, where there was, like, the certain websites, like, what are the things that you looked up and helped you learn a bit more about PDA and the resources that informed the content you produce on Instagram and Facebook, on your social media? Yeah, so I'd say that social media, it's actually funny, before I kind of was on social media and I'd gone on like a huge social media break. I was like, oh, I can't, it's just too much. And so I'd taken a huge break from social media. And when I came back, it was sort of in the heat of a lot of this sort of struggle and are trying to figure out what was going on. I was in the midst of kind of burnout myself from my, you know, intense corporate American job and simultaneously dealing with these struggles with my daughter. And it was just, I think that I have now sort of seen sort of how amazing social media can be for communities like the neurodivergent community. I think that for me, finding the community online was like literally life-changing, (laughs) life-saving. I was not in a great place and being able to find others who really understood what we were going through, what I was going through, what my kids were going through was really powerful. And I think that that helped me turn to a lot of resources. I spent a lot of my time, I initially saw some videos from another parent who posts sort of stories similar to the ones I do that talk about sort of some of the things that were confusing to them before they learned about PDA and how they see those things differently. And I think those real life examples are really helpful to individuals who are in these situations to help make sense of them and to feel less alone. And I felt that with some of the videos I stumbled upon and it really just set me off on this like year long journey of like really immersing myself. I think it probably was became my special interest and still is in the world of neurodivergence, autism, PDA, ADHD, I spent a lot of my time again, learning from those with lived experience. So there's a PDA advocate and um, they're an adult autistic PDA or and ADHD or um, themselves, Christy Forbes here in Australia. I took some of her online courses. There's a lot of adult PDAers out there who have really great accounts, but also some that offer online courses to help you know, you learn about PDA and the strategies that are effective from someone with lived experience, which I think is so important. The PDA Society, based out of the UK, they have a wealth of information in that I spend a lot of time on their website, really educating myself and looking for additional resources, books to read, accounts to follow, advocates to follow, blogs, etc. And all of that was so incredibly helpful in sort of my building my understanding of neurodivergence of autism of pda of my children and then being able to adapt to support them in a way that they need and i'd say just having the community too is just even still i feel i have these people that understand what i'm going through and and how the struggles that i have as a parent but also that understand and can see my kids for who they really are, not kind of the behaviors that often they get labeled because of. And so I think that having people who know, right, who know the experience and know that my kids aren't just bad kids, that they are whole human beings who are worthy of love and that, that deserve the support that they need, like having people who can help, who know that and help me constantly keep that in the fore front of my mind has been really beneficial. When you said about like being able to see children who they are and not follow the behaviors like that like people perceive them as on like I say that it's like 
importance of getting a diagnosis is understanding yourself and being able to access support. But like my hint there with like getting a diagnosis and I guess sometimes reading the reports and I guess reading on a more medical jargon list or on a bullet dots of information, it can sometimes depersonalize or the person you're talking about when you would talk about supporting your children, it's understanding their needs. It's something that services any support where they are in school or and parents should be able to find the time and patience to be able to understand their children beyond their children's behaviours and the causations of it and what's going on in bit more detail rather than just looking at how they act in and just kind of looking for like that quick fix solution or just going for anything in a parent handbook that might not be well best suited. I think that that has been one of the most eye-opening things about this whole experience for me and journey of self-discovery has been just this realization of just how little we know about the experiences of others and how different, right, one person's experience internally can be from another's. And I just see it now all the time, how the lack of either ability or desire or willingness to really think about kind of the other individual's experience causes so much problem in the world. And there's just so many disputes and arguments and whatever that could probably be avoided if we really sought to really understand someone else's experience. It's been really educating in that regards and helpful to me beyond just dealing with my kids. You know, I think that my husband and I's relationship as we really seek to better understand one another, things that used to be just things we would be like, oh, it's so annoying. Like, I hate it when they do this. We now understand and we talk about sort of some of those things, right? Like we'll talk about the small examples and it's always so eye-opening because I'll be annoyed about something and I'll pause and I now start to think about what might be going on for him. Like, am I missing something? And oftentimes I am. And when I stop and reflect upon what I know about him and how his brain works and what I know myself and how my brain works, I'm able to realize that I'm actually not upset with him. I'm frustrated by the situation because I need help with this, but I understand why he can't in this moment help me with this. I looked for other solutions or something, right? And so I think it's like, it's allowed us to not only communicate better, but just to offer each other more compassion and appropriate support for each other, given sort of our knowledge of each other's neurotypes and same with our kids. And so I think it's been that just really thinking about behavior is communication and not just sort of thinking about the behavior at, at just like the surface level has really been life-changing in so many ways of my life. <laughs> just thinking about that more. And I really wish that I could do that more because I think it would solve a lot of problems. What do you like see as a personal experience of neurodivergent that you, you hint at self-identifying as having ADHD and dyslexia, do you see yourself having other neurodivergent conditions and what are the things that you feel mainly affected by being neurodivergent? I think the, those are ones that I'm more, you know, confident in and feel strongly about. I think I have as I've continued to learn more and as I've continued in my kind of unmasking journey and as also if I've been sort of burnt out and as well, I think that I've started to also wonder if I may be autistic. And so I think that as I understand more about my ADHD and how that impacts me, there are still some things that don't quite fit right for me. And so I'm still exploring. But I think that the biggest things that have impacted me have really been executive function. And I think that I've struggled more recently as I try to work on building this platform and I'm working on developing a program to help support parents in their transformation as they support PDA, young PDAers in their lives and building an online community as well in terms of like a more private Facebook group for people to interact in. And so as I'm working on those things, I've really struggled with the executive function of 
accomplishing the things. Like I have all of the ideas in my head. I have all of these like, things that I know I want to do, but the process of doing them can be very hard for me. And that's, I think even harder for me as I compare myself to sort of my past life in the corporate world where I accomplished so much. But I also now looking back, realize that I was working well above my capacity and I was not in a good place. As I mentioned, I was dealing with a lot of anxiety, depression, feeling sort of trapped in my job and didn't know where to go. And and then the added layer of the challenges with my kids made it even more challenging. And so I don't want to go back to that either, but it is kind of hard to sort of be accepting of what my true capacity is and trying to work within my true capacity, probably for the first time in my life. <laughs> and this is something I realize now looking back, even just in my school years, I was constantly working outside of my capacity and just trying to compensate for what I didn't know were my disabilities. And so it's coming to terms with that and figuring out how to set up our lives to support ourselves and to work with my neurotype, not against it, and to work within my capacity and to, to learn and to accept that and be okay with that and know that like, again, treat myself with the same compassion I treat my kid. Like I am a whole person. My worth isn't tied to my productivity. And so having to constantly work on this sort of self healing, I guess. It's like, now we're at the point where we're in and they were divergent family and household. It's that thing where we can grow up with having they were divergent conditions and diagnosed in the survival mode and masking that thing. And it's like, until you're in that environment where you have that and they were divergent family and you've grown up yourself, gone through certain challenges with yourself, like full burnout, that I find you can feel a bit more disabled and more neurodivergent and you never try to recover to being the person you were before that burnout. And it's something that then, within that time and where you want your children to be able to understand yourself, be able to be okay within themselves and be able to have a better childhood and growing up than, than yourself in terms of the education and feeling like they understand themselves with that support. Then yeah, it makes you confront of who you are and that you can no longer hide from trying to mask and be in that survival mode when Maybe if things have been different sometimes, it's like you might have not been in the position to recognize that within yourself. And I guess having a never new a divergent husband has helped you to explore that within your relationship. And as you said, you worked for, on things communication wise to get things to work for yourselves. And so, I what and as I said, we've been having the executive fun dysfunction in it. That's something to be an artistic, having like potential AD ADHD traits, as I suspect myself to have an ADHD and got the sparks here. That's the things where, you know, there's an element of demand avoidance within that because setting up your own tasks is quite a challenge. And where, in terms of working out, if you can't know where, how to begin with a task or what you're doing within that task, as starting out your own projects, then you, you kind of distract yourself from and, and avoid doing it and find yes. different processes with that. That's how sometimes between executive dysfunction and PDA, then the blues. The lines can be blurred and it's a lot more complex and easy than being a straightforward thing to diagnose and recognize. Absolutely. I think that oftentimes you can get to that a little bit by starting to think about like, if you look at the things that trigger someone, 
are they consistently tied to sort of that concept of autonomy and equality? Because oftentimes the demand avoidance is a extension of sort of loss of autonomy, but there are other aspects, like it's not always demand avoidance. There's other things that just kind of invoke sort of an irrational or what seems like an irrational um, response or reaction um, that isn't necessarily related to any sort of demand or task. And so I think that helps separate it. But it's interesting because now that I am a little bit more burned out and have been having the challenges with executive function that I have, my husband and I talk about it a lot and I can relate very much to some of the demand avoidance and can have compassion because I experience it as well. Even though our internal sort of experiences around it as we talk through it are a little bit different and nuanced, there is that shared experience of the struggle that comes with like, we both have things that we want to do, we know we need to do <laughs> and struggle to do. Are the reasons underlying kind of causes of that may be different, but the experience and the frustration around that can be similar. I think it's, you know, it's the creating a household. I think it's funny, I, like family comes and visits and things are a bit <laughs> unusual, right? It's not like perhaps the typical family home and how we do things and the way we do things. And it's certainly not kind of exactly like my household was growing up. And that's not necessarily to say, you know, I didn't have a bad childhood at all. I was undiagnosed neurodivergent. And so I certainly think there are things that would have benefited me and it would have helped me to have that awareness myself. But I think that the way we eat and how we relax look different. And we really just sort of allow people to have their, we try to meet people's sensory needs and allow people to engage with their hyper focuses and special interests to regulate and don't try to kind of have control over those types of things and try to, try to provide a very autonomous environment for our children, obviously within sort of keeping them safe. <laughs> and so it looks very different. And that I think can take some unlearning as a parent, right, of social norms and expectations and how things should be done, but also sort of just kind of breaking those instinctual, like, patterns, right? You know, most of us, when we're parenting, kind of default into a lot of the ways that we were parented, and that's our instinctual reaction when we're faced with the situation is to react as our parents may have acted. But we have more awareness different knowledge of these things today than our parents did and having to sort of work through that initial reaction and break those patterns is really hard work. Um, and, but it's, you know, worth, worth doing. Um, and I do think that it's amazing to see my kids both. We talk about neurodivergence openly. We talk about PDA. They understand what PDA is. I mean, to the extent that four-year-old and seven-year-old can, you know, my daughter and both, and my son, um, even though he does not have a formal diagnosis, they refer to themselves as PDA at times. They will talk about how it's impacting them. They're amazingly self-aware and insightful. And even I look back before I even knew about any of this and I can see how my daughter was trying to communicate what she was experiencing and what she was struggling with. You know, she would tell me, Mom, don't say something, don't say it like that. I don't like it when you say it like that. And just things around the use of language that would make it more difficult for her to accept that communication using more kind of imperative versus declarative language can make a huge, using declarative language instead of more imperative language can be a huge benefit for many PDAers. And so I saw her sort of doing those things. She used to talk to me um, before I knew about PDA when she would get into a squabble or something with a, a mate. I would talk to her, I'd talk to her about it and she would say, I don't know, I can't help it. I'm just a mean girl or I'm just a bad person. And that really started to concern me. And I think now looking back, I can see she was trying to tell me like, I, I can't control this always. I don't have control over my body in these circumstances. And I see that now. And I think the thing I want to make different for her, right, is I don't want her behaviors to be 
if, if we don't help her have a label or help her understand that and who she is and why some of those things occur, other people are going to label her, whether it's rude or naughty or bad or mean. And that is going to then become part of her identity. And so I think we've been very open and talking to our kids about both the positive aspects, her strong sense of justice, her care for the environment, her creativity and her leadership skills or her like mentoring and teaching abilities. She has lots of strengths. And so we talk to her a lot about those things, um, but we also talk to her about the struggles and help her understand that they're, she's not alone in that either, that I've talked to lots of other parents who have kids who are into the same things, who have some of the same strengths, but also face some of the same challenges. So she knows that she's not alone, that this is all kind of normal, right? Like this is part of the natural variation of the human experience. We want her to grow up with that kind of positive framing and mindset while acknowledging that things are hard for her. And she, she sees that and knows that she feels that, but it, it makes me feel really good that she has a positive identity around it. Right. Like she likes telling, she'll tell her friends about how she's PDA on the playground at school. And she'll talk to her friends and self-advocate about let's not say things like you have to do this to each other because she finds that language to be very triggering. And I find it amazing that as a seven-year-old, she's out there advocating for what she needs and the relationships that she has. And I hope that, right, I continue to help foster that in her and that she continues to have that skill as she grows into an adult. I think that's important for a sense of resilience and actually being able to get the support that you want, improve education within it. And because like sometimes if you don't try to speak up, things might not be ever change for the better in terms of like people might not be able to have the chance to underst- understand how you behave and I was seeing that some with PDA and you know, with divergent conditions where whether it's ADHD and autism you know where, where sometimes you know, there's a lot of struggles where where you might be struggling out there in school whether that's just like not getting along with certain people uh, having a uh, falling behind in your classes and some I've oh, been told off given certain mornings by teachers or oh, like there's certain elements of like negative behaviors that is looked upon uh, and being able to work with your children how, no matter how young they are and opening that dialogue for them to talk to you about the experience as much quite good as parents to f- feel, feel that like safe experience a place to talk about things where you won't overreact and give them a space to not interject below them to talk about things as like what you're saying about P- PDA it's not like this kind of demand avoidance of like I'm just not doing that because ju- I-, I just won't do it but it's more like it's trying to make sense of things it'll make it make sense it's like Sometimes it can be that thing of the first sensory ways, like as you ended with like certain hygiene things and certain waking up, getting out of bed, there's certain like cause and effects and things to explain it. And you can of go like for some PDA as to play in a rational off like right away after all this and right so day afterwards, like questioning the reason behind things of a of some people just can play go along with it without knowing why they have to wear. and I guess if you like for teach that like in school says that hierarchy and sense of authority that can get you into a bit of trouble but I guess in understanding that as parents is quite a thing a good thing to learn because I guess from maybe what you've seen about other parents in the community within the community that as you hint at your daughter's got quite a all right experience of school if she can talk about those things and she can safely talk about these things with other children and I guess some of the other parents might not have you know a positive experience where they can report with their own children that it is around creating that safe space for them 
to not only talk about things and share their experiences, but for them to unmask. And another really common thing with PDAers is there's this sense of they have this internal equilibrium or balance that when it gets thrown off due to a loss of equality or autonomy, they their nervous system and their brain will do things to help them get back to kind of that equilibrium. And so that might be in the moment where if I make a demand of my daughter, she may make a demand right back to me. Like she might say, sometimes that is just sort of regaining autonomy over it. So, and it's, it can look like defiance. It look, can look like a lot of things, but if you really think about it, in my case with my daughter, I can see that she's communicating to me. I want to do this thing. I know I need to do this thing. And I'm trying to comply with your request, but I need, I need some sort of rebalancing to regain autonomy over it so I can execute. And so kind of that rebalancing type of acts, which could look like she says, yes, I'll get in my school uniform, but you have to put it on me right here. I'm not moving. That is her way of actually trying to comply with the request and meet the demand. And that is in the moment, but when they're masking, so it's school, my daughter masks extensively. She has some safe friendships and things where she'll talk more openly. But for the most part in school, she's trying to just not be noticed. And she is masking all of those activations she's experiencing throughout the day as losses of autonomy and quality. And I hear about these in terms of the things that she tells me about in the school day. You know, it's clear sort of that they're connected to these losses of autonomy and equality, whether that's something about the reward system being used in the classroom and her table not getting it. And yes, that can be upsetting to any child, but there you just notice these patterns, right? And the intensity with which they react to them. So she masks all day, but she's accumulating this activation. I hear people talk about it as like the soda bottle effect where you shake up a soda bottle all day long and then they get home and you take the cap off and they explode. We deal with that a lot, you know, so she... According to the school, and if you were just sort of an outsider looking in on her in the school environment, you'd be like, she's doing great. But the reality is that she's struggling big time with school. You just don't see it in the school environment. You see it more at home as she masks and then waits to do all of her rebalancing to bring her nervous system back to safety until she gets home because that's where she feels safe to do it. We try to create that safe space and allow her to rebalance as long as it's you know not hurting people and isn't causing her harm, but that isn't an ideal state. It allows, she uses every bit of her capacity while she's at school. And so when she gets home, she has zero capacity left for play dates, for extracurricular activities, for really anything. Now we're shifting our focus now that we have our formal diagnosis and and working on getting better supports for her in school because she has expressed a desire to stay in school um, versus a lot of families of PDAers choose to unschool or take their kids out of mainstream schools. She wants to stay there. And so we want to try to make that work for her. And to do that, we have to find ways to lower those demands and losses of autonomy and reduce those losses of autonomy and equality for her in the classroom, that she has some capacity left just to be a kid, <laughs> live her life. <laughs> Making that work for within that school environment is quite important because not many parents might have the privilege of being able to unschool no. or take them out to school and give them an alternative education because either it can be quite hard if you're to try to find them an alternative school from a mainstream environment, which, like, depending on where you live, you can't really find any alternative means of getting our education. And plus, to educate yourself, to be able to educate your children. Children is quite a big thing because sometimes when you look look at the work your kids might be doing, if, well, especially if they came to when she's in like high school or whatever, then that's the thing where you like become a bit stumped with, with some of the harder subjects of like certain things you might be not find well in with school and this in your sense. And then that's that's the thing is if like you're living in a household where like you both parents working, it's not it's not always that option and plus you know it's kind of like a failure of the school system if they 
aren't able to provide for every child and giving them an education. It's like, if it works for them, like having a appropriate home education, that's fine if they can be work right in a good way. But as you say then, it's that thing quite what's difficult for a child, especially for a new divergent child at school. It's something that you do need a lot more assistance and a chance to speak to somebody like about support and have like somebody feel safe with talking about because I was the same way like I preferred to have a challenge for we all like like problem of the day with school like certain things like that that may pop up every now and then it, it would be like me telling me my boy on the phone to school and sorting them it out and not be and not myself in that comfortable position because sometimes like we've got like in an environment where there'd be like 30 kids in a class and you're over 100 children in a school it's not like a place where you can have like somebody coming on to you with a time and pace and within your school day to go how are you doing really and being able to give that kind of private trust in conversation where you know like with being a divergent it can be quite challenging to communicate your needs, especially to somebody else. As you know, sometimes it takes a long time to get a rapport and truly understand what you are going through and to be able to, it can sometimes like take a long time to get your words out. And I guess have that comfort when your like, daughter comes home. We just got that space of having a one-to-one -one thing that school doesn't provide. And, you know, that's a, that thing for new divergent people that they can struggle with the school education system because sometimes there's typically not typically not a time and peace sense given for children to actually talk about their feelings and what things they have to help them. And, oh, they you said a lot of things that I really kind of was relating to as you spoke. I think the... The fact that so many PDA families end up unschooling, I think the PDA Society had a statistic that was said like in their survey was like 70 percent either, you know, couldn't access school or couldn't access school for some extended period of time. And that's a big number. And as you said, like, that is not an easy decision and nor an accessible decision for many. And so I don't think it's something most families come to lightly and after trying really hard to make the school system work. And I think that it is a failure of the school system. I think teachers have really hard jobs. I don't think the system is setting teachers up for success. I think that we try to put band-aids on some of these challenges when there really needs to be a much more robust reconstruction of the school system if it's truly going to work for all. But I think that the challenges I think a lot of PDA families face and PDAers face in the classroom too is this, this high masking. And I think that the neurobiology itself almost encourages masking in a way, whereas my daughter is intensely anxious about anything that might set her apart or might make others perceive her as somehow less than or different. And I think it's that equality piece of the PDA for her. And so there are things that I know would help her in the classroom with some of her sensory related things. She's autistic as well. And so she has some yeah. sensory needs. So she often would talk about having table fights when they're working in tables. Like she'd say something to somebody about being quiet and they'd tell her she was rude. She might benefit from wearing her ear defenders in the classroom, but like, She's not going to do it because that is going to somehow other her and may impact people's perception of her. They were asked to bring in a book from home for free reading time. And they said, it can be any book you want, um, as long as it's something you can read. And so my daughter was just agonizing over bringing a book because she really wanted to make sure it was something she could read because that's what the teacher had asked said to them we went through books that we had and the ones that met that criteria she felt like were too babyish she's behind in her reading and she didn't want to bring them because other kids were bringing in more chapter sort of early chapter books and that type of thing i tried to say well you could 
bring in something a little bit more advanced. And if you can't read every word, that's okay. People won't know. And she's like, they will know. Or if they don't know, I know. And I'll know that I can't read and other kids can. And so sometimes it can happen just internally, right? And so yeah. something as simple as bringing a book to read to school caused her so much anxiety. And I think this is one of the things that makes accommodating PDAers really hard in the classroom. One, they mask extensively. So oftentimes the school doesn't see it as a problem and they have limited resources and they're trying to prioritize where they see the issues um, being presented in the classroom. Um, and so she's a pleasure to have in class type of autistic kid. She's masking highly. And also the things that would help her a lot of them she won't participate in or won't agree to because she's concerned about that aspect of perception. And so we're trying to come up with creative solutions and ways to do things in a way that don't create that for her. And it's still a bit TBD on whether we'll be successful in that. But as long as my daughter has a desire to be in school, I run, again, want to respect her autonomy around that decision. Yeah and try my best to help the school create a supportive environment for her so she can continue to be there. When you've in the educational system, as you say, not sometimes in school, there's the reward charts and differ. Oh, and like sometimes being told off or doing anything disruptive, being asked to go out of class or like being told in anything off a cross tone or anything that could be preventing you for having going out for the break at the same time as anyone in class or any little thing that you could hear about that like this in some great or like like things some of you behaviors negatively because like sometimes if you can't make it to school for attendance that can cause a lot of anxiety like with stuff like that because like you can get pressed into like feeling you have to do it certain things and it, it's just that phone in the pawn and certain little things I could pick up from like the social environment of the exposed to and that really affects being a word divergent and you kind of react to that. Yeah. Absolutely. What like you as you described the idea of PDA profiles and to any like neurodivergent person it was autistic ADHD and suspecting to have these things. It's something that could make they, them understand themselves a lot more. Do you want to explain what I is? But first of all, I would want to comment upon, like, I guess, with the school experience. Like, if, like, you're not told or encouraged to, like, you wear your defenders or teachers actively encouraging you to, like, self-express yourself in a way that is di different for people and like okay and validating that that's like without that you might not be able to feel entirely comfortable within finding yourself and like going against like the the norms where you think is how people would ju judge you and like that would help you feel a bit more comfortable in, in yourself gone to the point of like the PTA a profile, so what does that look like and what are the things that makes up a PDA profile and way that people can work that out for themselves? The key traits of the PDA profile are that resisting and avoiding ordinary demands, and those could be internal, external, implied, societal, again, often irrespective of whether the demand is something the PDA wants to do or not. And again, oftentimes, that need for autonomy and quality override other basic needs. Using that variety of strategies to protect autonomy and avoid demands, whether it's ignoring, distraction, delay, procrastination, excuses, outright refusal, threats, negotiation, entering in role play, lying, lots of different strategies are being used. Oftentimes sort of the differences in social communication and understanding may be less obvious in a PDA profile than perhaps other autistic profiles, they copy and mimic a lot of social reaction interactions. I see my daughter frequently, and this is common of, uh, I think, probably many autistic children, but 
watching videos and practicing and kind of mimicking gestures in the mirror and that type of thing. Oftentimes they appear much more proficient at expressive language. They're good at communicating and expressing themselves to others but struggle a lot more with the receptive language and understanding and processing language. Sometimes this isn't as apparent at first, though, um, because they often don't let on if they don't understand something. They'll go along, and I've noticed this with my daughter. She will do it at home with me, where she will ask as her safe person, where she'll ask a question, or she'll say, I'm confused, or I don't understand. But she would never do that in the classroom setting. And oftentimes, if they're not around safe people, they aren't going to do that because it is a putting themselves into a position of losing equality. This person understands something I don't. I can't kind of put myself into that position unless I feel really safe. So oftentimes, you may not even know that a PDA -er isn't understanding or following along, which can be really challenging in the school environment, as you might imagine. And my daughter has said things like that, where she's come home and been like, I don't know, I don't really understand a lot of what's being said. She's not going to express that. And so she may need more assistance and kind of ways for teachers to validate that she is understanding without, again, kind of singling her out. I think oftentimes you'll see PDAs be really kind of rigid and inflexible in play, and they might have a need to sort of seemingly control the play. They can be obsessively competitive and possessive at times, so always needing to be first at something or really struggling with losing at a disproportionate amount kind of to peers. My daughter, even like an example from school, they were working with colored pencils or something. And apparently there was some rule that I don't think was explicitly stated, which she struggles with about only taking one item at a time, but she had two colors she knew she was going to need. And so she grabbed both colors because she's thinking ahead always of like, okay, I don't want to be in a position where I need this color and I can't access it because someone else is using it because that then is a loss of autonomy for her. I'm wanting to do something and I can't. And so she will kind of try to proactively protect herself and grab both colored pencils. And this led to an altercation in school, but oftentimes, right, like there's this protective or kind of can seem like possessiveness. That's really a protective mechanism for them. I see it with my daughter and my son with like markers. Like my son is really bad at remembering to put the lids back on markers. And so that was really triggering to her because she'd go to open a marker and it would be dried out um, and she couldn't use it. Loss of autonomy. We have to try to, we have separate markers for both of them now, but those are some of the things that can come through in terms of how it's often looked at from an external lens. Um, many PDAs also struggle to acknowledge social hierarchies as they imply inequality. So they often will kind of see parents and teachers as peers versus figures of authority and that can come through even in things like my daughter has consistently asked me, how come you and dad have always have the bigger bedroom with the bathroom attached? Or how come you guys have the air conditioner unit in your room? And just not really understanding some of those differences in sort of social hierarchies. It's just not intuitive for them. Oftentimes a preoccupation with sort of fairness as I talked about earlier, they may struggle to lose and in kids you may see more so than a typical peer or at a later age than a typical peer where they might cheat or change the rules to ensure they win. You see those excessive, what externally looks like excessive mood swings and impulsivity. So frequent meltdowns that seem disproportionate to the preceding event is oftentimes, right, they're not about that one event, that last thing. It's about that accumulation of threat response activation. And oftentimes these excessive mood swings are sort of what we're seeing as that rebalancing behavior of sort of they experienced a loss of autonomy. And so they need to kind of equalize to bring them back to neutrality and to that kind of balance that their neurobiology seeks. And I think kind of the last things you do see sort of a little bit of obsessive behavior often focused on other people. And this can be sort of special interest related, but it can also be you know, this constant need for undivided attention or co-regulation, which can appear kind of almost like extreme cleanliness or even kind of controlling the behaviors of others, oftentimes a particular parent or potentially a partner in an adult. And they may also become kind of almost obsessive about a particular friend. Oftentimes you'll see special interest type of things that are more people focused. 
and social in nature than perhaps others. Not that non PDAers can't have those types of special interests as well, but they just seem to occur in a lot in PDAers. And yeah, I think that a lot of PDAers are pretty comfortable in role play and have a preference for role play and pretend sometimes almost to an extreme extent, but similarly to kind of general play, you often sort of, when it's involving others, children who are PDA are often usually very controlling of the themes, roles, and dialogue, including kind of of others. So my children will often like, if I say something in a role play game we're playing and it's not what they wanted, like they'll tell, they'll feed me my lines, if you will, in terms of how we interact and play. So those are some of like the key traits. And then obviously, if you are in the camp, and this is sort of where I currently sit, although again, research is still really early and we need to explore more of PDA as a profile of autism, you would also expect to see, right, those more you know autistic traits that meet the criteria for autism. So that's your sensory stuff, stimming and repetitive behaviors, rituals, all of those types of things, as well as the kind of social communication differences and nonverbal communication differences and challenges in relationships. I think with autism and ADHD, there's so much that needs to be understood more, like with yeah. autism. Like I think with things in terms of academic, professionally, there could be a lot more explored with any like physical, chronic health conditions that can be called diagnosed as a thing with executive functioning and P PDA profiles and the common high levels of like ADHD within the autistic people and how sometimes that is overlaps and like yeah. sometimes people can get confused between the traits of the two conditions but then again it's like with conditions like when people describe like motor and uh, you know practical difficulties within being autistic that can link to dyspraxia as well as so there's lot of more to be understood what you describe as from PTA that is understandable I was perceived as within the profiles of being autistic and ADHD although it might be something that could be diagnosed on its own you know like not something that I'm personally you know an expert on or could comment yeah. on that but with you know from any of the like describing it can uh, more explains what the cause and effect of autistic people's behaviors and certain things have been autistic that just from an autistic diagnose says that you know the injustice areas and when stuff relating to hierarchies that an autism diagnosis and the traits listed can't necessarily explain on its own, but something like PTA can ex explain a lot more autism and ADHD traits that then what may be listed on the you know, on a documentation that explains the diagnosis from when every like a person who's autistic and ADHD got diagnosed as so it can be like the looking into this thing for anybody who's diagnosed with such conditions can explain a lot more about themselves i think it's going to be really interesting as like research continues and if we think about it wasn't that long ago where it was believed that autism and adhd couldn't coexist now we know that they commonly coexist there are so many co-occurring conditions amongst neurodivergent people that can change the presentation. And then there's just, right, like we're unique human beings too, with unique experiences and environments. I think it is such a complex world. <laughs> and I think that whether PDA lands as, hey, this is actually just kind of a, it's a presentation or a profile of autism it doesn't need a separate name, but we need to just better include kind of adapt assessments to better help kind of people identify these individuals or whether we think it ends up that like a separate diagnosis is warranted or helpful because it helps in differentiating the strategies that may need to be used with someone who has more of these traits or whether, you know, there's some people who will talk about 
maybe it's just how a few of these co-occurring conditions present together. And I don't know that we know the answers to that. I don't know that we'll ever know all of the answers to that, but I do think that individuals seeking to better understand their internal experience and whether that's through varied, various neurodivergences or other conditions so that they can better understand the whys behind their own behaviors and develop strategies to support themselves, regardless of where all of this kind of ends, <laughs> I think is a good thing. And so I think that that's what I want to help kind of my kids do is better understand themselves so they can figure out how to support themselves and function um, in the world. And I want to try to help other parents um, and individuals do the same. I think that exactly kind of where it lands, I think we'll, we'll, time will tell. Things have changed a lot over the course of our understanding of autism. And I think that will continue to evolve as we learn more. And especially as we hopefully as a society, listen more to the experience of like those with the lived experience as the experts. From discussion PDA, what, what you find out that for those who have PDA is the fact that what, like, the, how it can they impact mental health or what's like, like from like whatever, like social environment experiences. Because as you said, there's lot, sometimes a lot, lot of social negativity around it so and like a lot of the behaviors are triggered by ang experiences of anxiety so what's the understanding of mental health then in this area right now we see a lot of adult pdaers out there many of them were un like diagnosed and unsupported as in their childhood with kind of the way that they needed to be supported due to lack of awareness and understanding of the neurotype at the time. A lot of these individuals are, are, you know, suffering from trauma, constant threat response activation, living in a state of fight or flight. A lot of them are experiencing trauma as adults and experiencing anxiety, depression, suffering with joblessness and financial struggles, all of which compound those issues. There's a lot of adult PDAers who have found great success, right? And who have managed. And I, I love hearing stories of parents from a generation before who naturally fell intuitively into how to support their children. And a lot of the, I think the PDA parenting is sort of intuitive parenting. It's interesting. I think there are people who managed to get support. They didn't probably have the self-awareness and understanding with kind of external aspects of things. And so I think a lot of those individuals still probably struggled with relationships and with many of those types of things. But I think we don't really know what a generation of PDAers who is supported and who grows up with kind of awareness of their neurotype, we really don't know what that is going to look like and, and how that will shape kind of their experience as adults. Because most PDA adults haven't didn't have that experience as a child of being supported. I think it'll be, I'm hoping, right, that we're doing, that the work that a lot of parents are doing and the work that my husband and I are doing in supporting our children, right, helps, it's a long game. Like in the game I'm playing is really focused on that mental health aspect. A lot of PDAers end up internalizing if they don't have a supportive environment where they can express kind of themselves. Do see self-harm, eating disorders, suicidality. As a parent, I'm there may be things that I am concerned about health-wise, whether it's their hygiene and teeth brushing and the long-term impacts of that. Yes, I worry about those things, but the priority for me is their mental health and well-being and supporting that now. I want my child to grow up and be an adult. And other challenges that come up, if things shift and oral hygiene becomes a big concern, we'll change our game. We'll kind of adapt and see what we need to do. I think that the mental health aspect is a huge piece of it in terms of the impact that what PDAers experience as a result of kind of going undiagnosed and unsupported. And that's sort of been, my husband has had challenges with jobs, as I mentioned, and I think he never really realized it was anxiety and probably wouldn't have called it that, but as he's come to learn more and explored his own mental health, he has a lot of anxiety. So I think that it's definitely mental health 
there's a really good report the PDA Society did, I think, last year um, that talked about PDA and mental health. So if people are interested in learning more about that. There's a really good article on that that I think is pretty eye opening and talks really about the struggle that um, these individuals are facing and these families are facing too. It's a really important topic um, that I think we need to continue to stay focused on. It's definitely important just to be able to treat the physical health and the mental health as equal and be able to support getting that balance right and yeah. like making so we're on top of able to be on top of it all and like help your children to do, take care of themselves in those aspects of areas that's in terms of like and making so with the in but sometimes with the mental health like it does help just to guess support them on all those different things and have that support next to around. What are the things yeah. that be newer divergent and speaking up about PDA, do you think are the most important things that people so said no? I think that the thing that I wish everyone could just know is just acknowledge and to be curious about the why right behind people's behaviors and to not just kind of take behavior at surface value. I really wish that there was just more awareness or understanding around how different people's internal experiences of life and the world can be that if we could do that, that would solve, you know, so many things and so many neurodivergences, right? Like just being curious about other people's experiences and believing other people's experiences too. Everyone kind of has a natural tendency to kind of look at situations from their frame of reference, but it's possible to interrupt that, right? It's possible to challenge yourself to consider and really consider. I think we all talk about, and I've before I'd be like, oh yeah, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. But I think so often we think about someone else's experience still through our lens. And we don't really truly consider the internal experience. We only still are evaluating and looking at like what we can see. So I think that if people can get more curious around that for themselves, for people in their lives, and really kind of make that practice of pausing and thinking about kind of why, even with your own reactions, like, why am I reacting the way I am? Like, it's helped me, that understanding has helped me be able to better process and deal with my own emotions too. Like, because sometimes the way we react is not genuine. Sometimes we react on instinct, right? Like, I've been trained by media society that this behavior should anger me. <laughs> and so I feel angry. But when we pause and we stop to really think about what's going on, what's the experience of that person? Like, what are, what is their perspective? Oftentimes, sometimes the whole problem just sort of melts away and you realize that it's, it was just sort of this instant programming or these instinctual reactions. And so I think that it has been really helpful for me to like, just start to see the world in that lens. And I think above anything else, as we think about neurodivergence and PDA, I think if people could just be more open in that regards and that that alone would make a massive difference. I have a website, but the biggest place to find me right now, Instagram is probably my primary platform at Everyday PDA. And there you can also find in my bio links to sort of, I've developed a lot of free resources to help support families in their journey in parenting PDAers. And as I mentioned, I am working on, I don't have a launch date yet, but for those who are interested, they can go to my Instagram profile, join my email list. I will be launching a program that's really targeted to me, the Transformed Parent Program, and really targeted at the parent journey. And I think that's sort of what I realized is so much of the work that I needed to do to support my children was actually work on myself. So really helping parents kind of through that journey while also educating them around PDA and how to support their PDAers. As I mentioned as well, we'll be also kind of getting a private Facebook community up and running. It's been really great to see the engagement in some of my posts and just the interaction between individuals. And so really want to kind of provide a place for people to do so on a more ongoing basis versus just in the comment section. That is going to be coming up. Again, don't have specific launch dates right now, but those should be coming. So for those who are interested in those things, again, just um, following me on Instagram, um, and or joining my um, email list, which they can access through my the links in my bio. I do want to thank Chrissy Robinson again for coming on this podcast. 
and talking about her experience with her neurodivergent family, her research that she's done on PDA and what it means to have pathological demand of evidence and her own neurodivergent story. As I said, if you want to follow her, you can follow at new at uh, Everyday PDA. You'll be able to find details on social media and the website about how to follow her and follow her project and you can be able to find video clips as well and highlights of this podcast interview on social media at New Rainbow Project and where you'll be able to in a day or two be able to watch this interview on YouTube and Facebook. Please check out the uh, video channels information on that on the website newrainbowproject.com I want to tell you about what's coming up in the rest of the season next week we got to me Sautier she's got the social media account called Black Dyspraxic we chat about his experience of being neurodipsy the and the dyspraxic and that's coming next Sunday then the Sunday afterwards I'll be chatting to Bex Folsom, which they are autistic, dyspraxic, ADHD and non-binary trans and will really go into the details about gender identity, their sexuality and what it means to have urgent conditions with identified non-binary and plus the identity with asexual or antic. And we'll be discussing as they are a member of the Liberal Democrat UK party, which I am myself for transparency. We'll be chatting about the work they've been doing within the party as a party activist who is involved in any wood divergent and disability groups and informing the policy on that as well as looking at the policy that the the youth demographic have within the party the young liberals will be exploring the work they've been doing on that policy within supporting autistic people as i said i'm a member of the lib dems myself and i'd be trying to keep that as balance and trying to be able to ask some questions that maybe that somebody of an opposing party would make want to be asked themselves. Since this is a, an election year in the UK, the year that the general election is supposed to be held on, as could be announced, you know, for where will be the or like the uh, summer months or the autumn. It's something that I hope for, to explore the policy and the issues around disability and neurodivergency within British politics and how you can inform your decision at the next election if you're a British li- listener and explore life uh, as a disabled person and a neurodivergent person within the UK. I'll be asking people of different political parties to come on and explore the, how they are involved in politics as a neurodivergent person and what their interests are within politics and how what they think of if life having disabled people in the UK. I'll be looking towards doing some episodes on that as what it's like as well in other countries, what disability being disabled is like and looking at how the state supports them in their countries and what type of things are on offer for in terms of the politics for people of minority group as this is the with the most some of the most elections in record for de- democracy which will be also reflecting on some of the American issues as well as the last episode that went out in November featured me chatting to Ola Ojirimu, who has been involved in the Democrat Party in America and has campaigned strongly on the disability as somebody who owns a non-profit organisation and explored the intersectionality issues of that. If you want to explore 
the past episode of that and get an understanding for what disabled in America being disabled in America is like you can find on YouTube and I hope to have more episodes in a series of disabled in America coming up this year and looking at the crypto vote campaigns the different disabled campaigns going on in American politics so if you got any ideas for, for politically guest Stephen to come on who can speak about neurodivergent issues and activists or whatever disabled people whether that's in here in the UK or abroad in uh, whether that's in America or of uh, international countries as I know we've got many international listeners of the podcast please do get in touch whether that's DM me, me on Rainbow Project on social media or wherever you want to get in touch via email. You'll be able to get details about how to get in touch on the website. But as this is going out on Visibility Day, I want to also direct you to the episode, one of the episodes I did about autism and gender. Speak to a non-binary activist and advocate within the non-binary, trans, queer, autistic community. One of the leading figures within these communities is Livic Rivera. I interviewed Livic as one of the first interviews I did way back in 2020 summer. So if you go back through the podcast feed where you're listening to on podcast and platforms, you can find and this is before they publicly changed their name to Livic Reviva. Being able to have the interview with Bex Folsom to talk about gender identity. The podcast can be visible within a trans autistic community and it is important as not identifying as non-binary to be able to have these spaces where we can unmask become who we are and whoever we are because Trans Visibility Day is a part of being able to express ourselves and within the trans autistic community or trans non-binary community and the neurodivergent community it is a part of our mask and mask for all of us that we identify as having different genders and part of our, our us unmasking who we are and becoming the person that we are except except who we are is by having space that we can talk about these things and be able to fully express ourselves thanks again for listening and subscribing to this keep on sending this in podcast to people be back next week